Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Um, Matthew Campbell here from IPAC in Nova Scotia. Uh, the privilege of serving as the past chair of the Institute of Public Administration of Canada. Um, really pleased to welcome all of you here today for what will be a really exciting discussion uh, on the future of Nova Scotia's climate. Uh, as always, we'll be taking questions uh, throughout the discussion. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, Alex, our special speaker for today, please um, enter it through the chat on YouTube. And then um, toward the end of the discussion, we'll reserve some time to bring in um, audience questions. And we're going to be having uh, IPAC Nova Scotia Chair uh, Cynthia Ryan come in and moderate the discussion. Um, moving things along, I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, our speaker for this evening's presentation. And that is the man next to me, um, Alex Cadell. Um, Alex is a climate service specialist with, uh, you're actually cross posted, Alex, with Climate Atlantic, uh, who you're going to tell us a little bit about shortly, um, as well as the Nova Scotia in, uh, Department of uh, uh, Environment and Climate Change. And a little bit about Alex. Alex holds a Master of Climate Change from the University of Waterloo and a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Sciences uh, from the University of Guelph. Um, he brings experience in downsca downscaling and analyzing localized climate change projections, adaptation in the forestry sector, and managing climate change projects with the Confederacy of Mainland Enigma. Um, his work uh, right now involves supporting Nova Scotians in accessing, um, understanding, and applying climate change data to adaptation decision making. So um, a lot of that work applies to this presentation. So we're really keen to learn more about the future of Nova Scotia's climate, how that's going to impact our different regions, how that's going to uh, impact our different industries, and what this means for uh, public services and, and, and all Nova Scotians. So, um, Alex, I'm going to hand the proverbial microphone over to you and kind of fade out our, our intro music. So um, really look forward to your presentation. And um, again, if folks want to contribute a uh, question for the session, they can enter that into So Alex, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you for the introduction there, Matthew. Uh, and certainly thank you to IPAC as well for extending the invitation for me to come and speak about uh, Nova Scotia's changing climate here today. I think this is a topic, climate change, where particularly a lot of, uh, we've seen a lot of growing awareness in recent years, particularly where people are able to start reflecting on their own lived experiences and recognizing that our weather conditions and our seasons are already somewhat different from what they used to be. But I think what is often less clear to many people is how exactly climate change may directly affect you, your communities and the work that you do. So I'm here today to talk a little bit more about the magnitude and the timing of some of the climatic changes that we're expecting in Nova Scotia and provide some insights on what this might mean for our region. Oops. But before we get to that, I wanted to, as Matt mentioned, just talk a little bit more about Climate Atlantic, which is this organization that I am uh, attached to. Uh, it is relatively new, so assuming many of you have not yet had a chance to hear of it, uh, so I thought this was a good opportunity just to talk about what it is that we're trying to accomplish with uh, with the organization. So Climate Atlantic was just recently uh, launched in December of last year as the Climate Services Hub for Atlantic Canada. And when I say climate services, really that refers to a whole variety of different things, including providing data, information, tools, training, networking and facilitation, and other similar products and services related to climate change. We're under the umbrella of the Canadian Centre for Climate Services uh, National Network of Regional Climate Organizations. That also includes Uranos in Quebec, the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium in British Columbia, as well as Climate West in the Prairies. And really our purpose is to support all organizations, all sectors in the Atlantic region with their climate data and adaptation needs. So we have a mandate to deliver climate services, which are driven by our user needs, provide access to locally relevant, scientifically sound climate information, build our local capacity to work in this climate change space, and offer different types of training and support, which is something you're all currently engaging in. So thank you for making some time in your day to learn a little bit more about this topic.
I also just wanted to quickly highlight our website here, climatlantic.ca, which is something you might want to check out a little bit later. Uh, it includes a lot of useful information and links to different data portals, for example, uh, as well as a quite a fantastic monthly newsletter that you can sign up for there and help desk function as well, which I always like to highlight. So if you have any questions about climate change and how it might impact uh, yourself or, or what you do, uh, certainly feel free to reach out to myself uh, through the, the contact information there. But if you forget who I am, there's also a generic help desk function where you can submit your question and we'll tap into our network of expertise to uh, track down an answer for you. So that's a little introductory piece out of the way. Let's talk about what I'll be going through here for the, uh, the presentation over the next hour or so. So I'll be talking first a little bit about Earth's climate system, what it is, why it's changing, and how we know. Then we'll talk about projecting future climate, just so we're all on the same page about where this information is coming from. Then we'll spend the bulk of our time talking through a series of five key findings that have come out of the latest updated climate projections that we've done for the province of Nova Scotia. Those being it's getting warmer, our precipitation patterns are changing, we're expecting more frequent and intense storms, our sea levels are rising, and our oceans are changing. And we'll go through some of the data and hazards associated with each of those. And then in our final section, we'll wrap up with some insights on what this might mean for our region, pulling some of the key messages from the recently released Atlantic chapter of the Canada in a Changing Climate report. But to get us started here, let's talk about Earth's climate system. I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with the idea of weather. If you have ever uh, stuck your head out a window, uh, we know that sometimes it's hot or cold, wet or dry, cloudy or windy, or really a whole variety of other conditions that uh, just describe what is happening outside. But when we're talking about climate, on the other hand, we're talking to about the long term patterns and averages of weather over periods of at least 30 years is what's recommended by the World Meteorological Organization as uh, what's a long enough period of time to start referring to as climate. So put another way uh, for weather, we might ask ourselves a question like, if I'm going outside today, what do I need to wear to be prepared? Whereas for climate, that same question may take the form of what clothes do I need to have in my closet to be prepared for the typical weather patterns in the area in which I live? But if we zoom out and look at Earth's climate system as a whole, just recognize that it's driven by energy in the form of heat from our sun, and it is the uneven heating of the Earth's surface that drives this complex three-dimensional global circulation of air and water around our planet. And that's represented in the diagram on the right there. But really the energy that enters our climate system should be the same as the energy that leaves it. You know, it's a system that for many thousands of years has been in relative equilibrium, unless there's some sort of change within the system. And that's where greenhouse gases come in. These are compounds that just due to their molecular structure are very effective at trapping heat within our atmosphere. And this includes gases like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and various fluorinated gases. And the concentrations of all of these compounds are increasing in our atmosphere due to human activities. So I'm not sure how legible the uh, scale on the graph is here, but just for those of you that are having trouble seeing it, uh, this shows carbon dioxide or CO2 concentrations in our atmosphere over the last 10,000 years, which is certainly the period of time most relevant to human civilization at the very least. And we can see that over much of that time, CO2 concentrations in our atmosphere were quite stable, around 260 to 280 parts per million or so, until this spike that started a few hundred years ago, which coincided with the widespread, exponentially increasing human use of fossil fuels. So just as of yesterday, May 24th, the latest CO2 reading in our atmosphere was up over 421 parts per million. Now, the trend so far has been for our global emissions to continue increasing each year. You know, we haven't even gotten to the point where we've leveled off our annual emissions, let alone started decreasing them, uh, at least on a global scale. And that's important to recognize because our climate will not stop changing uh, until we get to a point where globally our emissions reach that net zero target that, uh, that many countries are aiming for right now. And while there have certainly been numerous international commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, which is very important, uh, many of those do still lack a very concrete plan on how those targets will be met in the, in the timeframes that, that, that they have uh, allotted themselves. Which is to say that there's certainly been some progress, but recognize that we do still have a long way to go, uh, particularly looking at how far our concentrations have risen so far. The other point I just wanted to make here was the long residence time of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. 
And what I mean by that is that once these compounds are emitted, they often take decades and in some cases centuries to naturally break down or be withdrawn into other processes. So what that means is when we make the choice to emit greenhouse gases, we've also signed ourselves up to deal with the consequences for generations to come. Now, if we know greenhouse gas concentrations are increasing, you might be wondering whether we've already seen an impact on the climate. And the answer there is an unequivocal yes. Uh, our, we've seen our climate warm at a rather unprecedented rate, at least within human history. And that observed warming is driven by emissions from human activities. Uh, the graph on the right here is just quickly, um, just to quickly describe it, is showing uh, modeled um, global surface temperature if it was only driven by natural forcings, which is in the green uh, color towards the bottom there, versus if you include both the human and natural forcings, which is the kind of uh, brownish envelope there, with the observed trend overlaying in black, and we can certainly see uh, which trend it uh, most closely follows. So the latest trend or the latest estimate that I've seen for global surface temperature increase is that we're up at around 1.1 degrees uh, for the latest decade over pre-industrial. So just noting that when scientists and global leaders are discussing the need to keep warming below 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius to avoid dangerous consequences, I think it's important to recognize that we're already most of the way there. Now, of course, when we're talking about evidence for climate change, I think it's also incredibly important just to mention that we have other sources of evidence, uh, in particularly in our region of Mi'kma'ki, uh, for those of us in Nova Scotia, at least, um, we're, we're part of that territory. Um, and the local Mi'kmaq people are, uh, have, have traditional knowledge that is, uh, has been developed over more than 13,000 years of recognizing ecological patterns. So one thing that I always like to uh, make a linkage between is uh, the, the Mi'kmaq calendar and climate change. For any of you who aren't familiar with it, the Mi'kmaq calendar is based on moon cycles over the course of a year and relating that to various biophysical indicators. So if we look at what has given name to uh, some of these moon cycles, we see things like Sugogus or March, uh, which is maple sugar time, or Nipnagus in June when the trees are fully leafed, or Gepthegewigus in November when the rivers are starting to freeze. And if we start to look at some of these patterns, we can recognize areas where the biophysical indicators are already departing from what has been considered normal in this area for many thousands of years. So if we take these multiple lines of evidence and start to understand that we know our climate has changed and we know the cause, I think a very natural next question is to better understand where are we headed? And the way that we accomplish that is by looking at projecting future climate. So the way that we go about this is various research institutions and, and scientific groups around the world have developed a series of complex climate models to simulate the different physical, chemical, and biological processes in Earth's land, atmosphere, and oceans. And the results that come out of these simulations, what we call projections, help us to better understand the long-term patterns and averages of the climate system. So again, just a reminder here that with climate models, we're not attempting to forecast conditions at a specific point in time, the way that a weather model does, but rather to help us understand what the average conditions in a future period of time might be. Now, due to the extreme complexity of these global models, we often have to further downscale the results to be more relevant to our local area. So I just wanted to highlight off the top here that all the data I'm talking to you about today is coming from an ensemble of 27 different climate models that have been statistically downscaled and interpolated to an approximately 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid, which has been bounded to the borders of Nova Scotia, which is just a, a fancy long way of saying all the data I'm talking to you about is locally relevant and it is scientifically sound. I think it's also useful to acknowledge that there are sources of uncertainty in climate projections both due to the chaotic nature of the climate system that we're trying to model, as well as the uncertainty of human decision-making further into the future. But overall, the causes of that uncertainty are quite well understood, and the consensus is that we have enough information to effectively take action. Now, final piece of context here, I just wanted to highlight that one of the ways that we examine that uncertainty is by using climate change scenarios that represent different plausible futures. So mostly I'll be focusing on a high emission scenario today called RCP 8.5. Uh, RCP just stands for Representative Concentration Pathway with the number, in this case 8.5, denoting the change in radiative forcing that that level of greenhouse gases would result in. And the reason we're focusing on that here is because that scenario, that high emissions pathway, does most closely match the increasing trajectory of our global emissions to date. <laughs> 
However, one message I always like to get across here is that our projections are actually quite consistent across scenarios for at least the next several decades. And that's a reflection of our climate system adjusting to the greenhouse gases that we have already emitted. So we can see that whether we continue on this high emission trajectory or are able to move very rapidly towards net zero, we know that at least for the next few decades, we're going to be continuing to experience some change. And that rate of warming that we are already currently experiencing will result in some very different climate conditions by mid-century. So I'm going to wave my mouse around on screen here, and I'm not sure how well it will show up, but uh, for those of you that can that can see this at all. If we look at around 2040, 2050 or so mid-century uh, and just look at how uh, even an average year in that time frame will be quite a bit warmer than the uh, historical conditions, which are denoted in that envelope in gray towards the beginning of the graph there. And that's a bit of an issue because many of our built and natural systems are designed for and adapted to the range of historical climatic conditions that we are departing from. So all that being said, let's get into what this means for Nova Scotia. As I mentioned off the top, we've recently updated our climate projections for the province of Nova Scotia. We've identified a series of five key messages there that we think Nova Scotians should be aware of about how our climate is changing. And we're gonna talk through each of those in turn, starting with this, it's getting warmer. So I have a lovely full chart for you here, and I'm going to break down exactly what it is that we're looking at before we start walking through it, just so this is all very clear. Um, really first on the left hand side, we have a series of uh, variables related to temperature and I'll talk through each of those in turn in just a moment here. But certainly wanting to highlight that I'm showing data here for three different time periods. First, our baseline period of 1981 through 2010, which is aligned with historical observations and shows really what our climate used to look like in the, in the province of Nova Scotia. Next to that, we have data for mid-century, representing the average 30-year uh, period centered of uh, 2035 through 2065, which again shows the changes that we're on track for pretty much regardless of emission scenario and represents the minimum of what we should be preparing for in the decades to come. And then on the right, we have data for the end of the century, representing an average year in the period 2065 through 2095. And this shows what we're on track for under that high emission scenario that I mentioned. So certainly there's still an opportunity here to avoid this part of our future if we see some relatively immediate and relatively drastic reductions in global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But for the time being, it does present a useful upper bound scenario for some of our risk assessment purposes, for example. Uh, and then final thing to mention here is just the values you're seeing in the chart themselves are the median values of that multi-model ensemble that I mentioned, and they have been averaged across uh, the province of Nova Scotia as a whole. So depending where exactly you're located in the province, the magnitude might be slightly different, but the trends are certainly consistent. So let's start talking through what this actually means, starting with mean annual temperature. So historically, we averaged around 6.6 .6 degrees as our mean temperature over the course of a full calendar year. Whereas by the middle of the century, we can see that increasing to 9.2 degrees, and by the end of the century to 11.1 .1 degrees. Now, I know mean annual temperature isn't necessarily something that means a whole lot on its own, but I think it does provide a really useful point of comparison when you're uh, thinking about some of the different national or, or global uh, temperature increase uh, numbers that you might see and comparing that to what that means for Nova Scotia. So again, for our province by mid-century increasing by about 2.6 degrees and by the end of the century by 4.5 degrees. And if we start looking at some indices that have a little bit more relevance to day-to-day -day life, we could start looking at things like the annual hottest day that we experience. So this is just looking at air temperature, not accounting for humidity in this case, but uh, if we look at the hottest day that we used to experience in a typical year, 29.6 might, uh, might be that temperature. Whereas by the end of the century, 34.4 degrees might be the warmest temperature we see in a typical year. We can also look at the number of days that exceed certain heat thresholds. Here I have the number of days over 29 degrees Celsius, which aligns with the typical criteria for issuing a heat warning in Nova Scotia. Historically, we averaged about two days per year that met that threshold, whereas by mid-century, around 14 days or two weeks, and by the end of the century, 32 days or over one full month uh, would be under that heat warning criteria. We can also see a very similar pattern in the number of nights over 18 degrees Celsius. These are what we call tropical nights. Um, you certainly experience them. They're really warm, muggy, difficult to get to sleep. Um, and I, I won't go through the, the numbers exactly here. Just note it's, just a, it's a very similar trend, uh, which shows that it's not only higher temperatures during the day that we're contending with, but also the lack of relief overnight that we might typically be used to in our region. <laughs> 
If we look at some of the cold temperature indices, we can actually see that winter is warming most rapidly out of all of our seasons. So looking at the annual coldest day that we would typically experience in our baseline period, negative 21.9 degrees air temperature would be, uh, would be what we see in a typical year. Whereas by the end of the century, negative 13.6 might be that coldest temperature that we see. That also, as you might expect, drives down our number of extremely cold days, though it's below negative 15 degrees Celsius. Historically, we averaged about 15 days per year that were below that threshold, whereas by the end of the century, less than one would be typical. We can also see our average temperature in the winter season increasing from well below zero, negative 3.7 degrees, to above zero, positive 1.3. And as you might imagine, that can have some quite significant implications for the characteristics of our typical winter season in terms of snow and ice, where they're found and, and how long they last. We're seeing a decrease in the total number of freeze-thaw cycles that we experience, which are days where the temperature fluctuates from above and below zero. Historically, we average about 44 of those days per year, whereas by the end of the century, that would decrease to around 35. And certainly an important seasonal shift within this as well where we're losing a lot of the freeze-thaw events that would typically take place during our shoulder seasons of spring and fall, with more of that freeze-thaw concentrated during the winter season itself. We're also projecting an increase in the length of our growing season with these warming temperatures. Historically, we average about 200 days per year that were uh, available for, for growing vegetation, whereas by mid-century, we can see that increasing to around 230 days, an increase of about a month, and by the end of the century, an increasing to 255 days, of uh, an increase of almost two months. And that certainly presents an opportunity for producing more food or growing different crops. But I do always like to pair that with the caution that it does also introduce new risks due to new pests, diseases, and invasive species that could impact our native vegetation. And finally, here for, for this chart, I'm just showing the uh, number of heating and cooling degree days, which are uh, a bit of a more challenging measurement to wrap your head around, really. Uh, just think of them as the demand for heating and cooling based on the temperature outside. So we can see that with warming temperatures, we're expecting a reduction in the total demand for uh, meteorological demand for heating in our winter season on the order of about 30%. Whereas the drastically warmer temperatures during our, our summer season will drive up our demand for cooling quite dramatically on the order of about 500% by the end of the century. So that certainly means that, you know, in our region, we haven't necessarily needed a whole lot of artificial cooling. But uh, businesses, institutions, and homes that uh, historically not uh, needed to look at those types of systems may need to start considering them to properly support human and animal welfare. So just to pull some of this out for some of you that are less uh, numerically minded and just highlight a few of the key trends here. So for this, it's getting warmer piece, uh, we can see that our average temperature could increase by 4.5 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. Those higher temperatures mean that our summer days and nights will be more uncomfortable. Our winters are warming most rapidly out of all seasons, meaning that we'll see less extreme cold and our average winter temperatures could be above zero degrees Celsius. And our growing seasons will be longer, which could pre present an opportunity and a challenge. So thinking of some of the hazards associated with these warming temperatures, I just wanted to specifically highlight that we can expect increases in the frequency, the severity, and the duration of extreme heat events. That poses risks to public health. For example, there are notable increases in mortality rates at higher temperatures, also poses risks to outdoor work and recreation, as well as many important species and ecosystems that aren't adapted to cope with that extreme heat, and even some of our infrastructure that isn't designed to operate in those conditions, uh, specifically some elements of our transportation and electri electricity transmission networks, for example. The increased likelihood of hot and dry conditions could also drive up the prevalence of events like drought and wildfire in our province. And even some of our cold weather hazards like extreme cold and snowstorms will certainly be less prevalent, but will still occur in our climate. And sometimes these events can be more impactful when we're less prepared for them and we haven't switched over to our winter tires yet, for example. So we can't be complacent about those just yet either. So moving on to our second key message here, precipitation patterns are changing. So a similar chart here, I'll spend a little bit less time on it, uh, really just wanting to highlight a few key trends here. Uh, first, we're projecting an increase in total annual precipitation. Historically, we average around 1,315 millimeters of precipitation per year in our province, whereas we can see that increasing by about 6% by mid-century and by about 11% by the end of the century. I've also broken this down by seasons here, so we can see that we are expecting increases uh, on average across all seasons, but most notably in spring and in winter. 
However, I, I do always like to mention that more precipitation doesn't necessarily result in more available water. And I'll touch on that again in, in the next slide in just a moment here. We're also seeing a change in the type of precipitation that we receive as temperatures warm. Uh, probably not a surprise, but that will result in more precipitation falling as rain instead of as snow. So for example, looking at the number of days with snow, historically we averaged about 39 days per year where snow fell, whereas by the end of the century, only 17 days per year with snowfall might be more typical. And finally, we're seeing a trend towards more intense rainfall events, which we can see in the fact that uh, really there's no change in the total number of days with precipitation, which means that we're getting more total precipitation in the same number of events, driving up some of those events uh, intensity. So looking at the number of days that exceed 20 millimeters of precipitation, for example, or most intense uh, rainfall event days, you can see an increase there from an average of 16 events per year in a baseline period to 20 uh, of those events per year by the end of the century. And certainly some uh, associated increases in our average maximum one day and maximum five day precipitation totals. So again, just pulling out those trends for those where it makes more sense in words rather than in numbers, but we're seeing a trend towards more total precipitation, but also pairing that with the caution that more of that water will evaporate in warmer air or run off in more intense downpours. Also seeing a trend that as temperatures warm, more precipitation will fall as rain instead of as snow. And we're seeing a trend towards more intense rainfall events, which could increase our risk of flooding. That leads us nicely into our third key message to convey here, being that we can expect more frequent and intense storms. And really what I'm referring to here are these tropical storm and hurricane events that form you know, well to the south of us and occasionally make their way up our coast and impact our province. And that's driven by warming oceans that enable these tropical storms to travel much further north before weakening. So for example, we've seen uh, projections in the literature of uh, peak wind speeds associated with these storm events increasing by about 3.7 to 7 kilometers an hour by the year 2100, which again isn't a, a dramatic increase, but certainly shows that these storms will on average be a little bit stronger. These more intense storms will also bring more powerful and destructive storm surges, and overall it will be more likely for larger storms to impact our province and to uh, cause more damage when they do. So highlighting some of the hazards associated with these types of storm events, this includes things like flash flooding, high wind events, storm surge, coastal erosion, and landslides. And these photos are all from recent events from across Nova Scotia. And I think they're a useful reminder that even the current hazards we're exposed to can already be very impactful. And climate change is really only exacerbating those existing risks. Moving on to key message number four here, our sea levels are rising. And I always like to just pause on this photo for, uh, for a few moments here to convey a, a quote that's really stuck with me. That being that with sea level rise, today's storm surge is really just tomorrow's high tide. And if we look at you know, the magnitude of sea level rise compared to some storm surge events, those things do actually end up being relatively comparable. And if we think about water levels like this occurring potentially twice a day at high tide, rather than just once every 20 or 30 years when a major storm hits, we start to uh, wrap our heads around the magnitude of the challenge facing some of our coastal communities and infrastructure, uh, like this picture that was taken in Liverpool, Nova Scotia during a recent flooding event. But more specifically, looking at some of the projections for sea level rise, um, and I guess I should just mention uh, quickly here when I'm talking about sea level rise, I'm really referring to relative sea level rise, which includes several different factors, including thermal expansion of the oceans, melting land ice, and changes in vertical land subsidence. But taking all of those factors into consideration, we can see that sea, level, sea levels around Nova Scotia are expected to rise by a median of about 68 to 100 centimeters by the year 2100. Again, probably a small legend on the figure here. Apologies for that, it's not mine. Um, but uh, for those of you that, uh, that can't see that well, just noting that the greener colors in the figure here are more towards the lower end of that range, whereas the higher colors, are, or, sorry, the redder colors are more towards the high end of that range. So we can see that we're expecting the highest increases in relative sea level around Cape Breton and secondarily around Halifax, though certainly sea level rise will impact all portions of our province in a relatively substantial way. I think it's useful to mention that this estimate does not include potential instability in the Antarctic ice sheet, which could add an additional 65 to 70 centimeters of sea level rise on top of that amount by the year 2100. Now, at the present point in time, that's being regarded as quite a low likelihood event, but it would obviously be impactful enough, and it is within the, the realm of possibility, that it's something scientists are watching very closely. And it's something that certain jurisdictions have already started to plan around for some of their most vulnerable uh, coastal developments, for example. <laughs> 
think it's also useful to remember that the actual water levels we experience will still be influenced by things like storm surge. And we've seen surges of up to 1.6 meters during hurricane events in recent years, as well as high tides and coastal geomorphology. And uh, so really it's, it's useful to plan around a, um, what, a, what would happen if a major storm event hit at high tide under a high, high sea level rise scenario uh, to identify where that would put water levels. And I'm actually just gonna walk through a quick example to show you what I mean by that. So here's some data on flooding return periods, which I'll just highlight a, a couple areas of very quickly here. First, just noting that there's three main factors that influence coastal water levels when we're looking at the long term. The first of these is tides, which I'm sure we're all aware are the results of uh, gravitational forces. Second is storm surge, which is a localized pooling of water due to reduced atmospheric pressure and strong winds that are often associated with storm events. And third is sea level rise. So I've circled here in red at the bottom right of this chart here, uh, some data from uh, a colleague of mine, Rial Dag. He uh, put this together uh, in 2011, so it's a little bit out of date now, but I think it still uh, illustrates the point nicely enough. But this is looking at the return period for a one in 100 year storm or a storm that has a 1% probability of occurring in any given year under a high uh, sea level rise scenario for the year 2100, uh, if that would occur at high tide for, uh, for Halifax as a location. So we can see there that that would put water levels at around 4.17 plus, plus or minus 0.58 meters. So if we take the plus on that, we see that gets us close to five meters or so, which will make sense when I flip slides here uh, to show um, what we use uh, sometimes to look into these types of problems is some sort of flood visualization tools. So what I'm showing here are images of the Halifax Peninsula, for those of you that aren't familiar with the region. On the left with zero meters of water level increase, and on the right is five meters, which is that number I arrived at on the chart uh, that I was just showing prior, which would be a very rare event, but certainly still plausible. This is a uh, visualization coming from a tool called the Maritime Coastal Flood Risk Map, which was developed by the Applied Geomatics Research Group at the Nova Scotia Community College, who do some fantastic work in this area. And it's based on LIDAR data, which can be used to create very, high, very accurate high resolution digital elevation models. So these types of projections and visualizations can be very effective for understanding what is at risk. As we can see in some of the areas that are uh, kind of covered in blue in the figure on the right there, can identify areas of potential infrastructure damage, properties that may be flooded, even some of our transportation routes or emergency services that may be, uh, that may be cut off uh, if, if some of those roads were to be underwater. So tools like this, I think, can make a, a big difference for people understanding what their own risks are. And we do have LIDAR data that has been flown for the entire province now, but there isn't a flood risk viewer for the entirety of Nova Scotia just yet. Certainly a lot of conversation going on around how to get there. Uh, but for the time being, there's just a few locations that we can uh, make this sort of analysis for. But I think it, it does provide a really useful example. So again, just to highlight some of the hazards associated with rising sea levels, I think things like coastal flooding and storm surge are relatively obvious, uh, but also uh, some of the hazards include things that are less thought of, including, uh, for example, saltwater intrusion, which could impact the availability of fresh water in some of our coastal aquifers, as well as impacts on some of our coastal ecology, particularly some sensitive ecosystems like dunes or salt marshes that may not necessarily be able to keep pace with this rate of sea level rise, particularly if they're already constrained by different types of infrastructure on the back end. Final key message to convey here is that our oceans are changing. And I'll, I'll just flip through a few things quickly here. First, showing some sea surface temperature projections from uh, actually the, the, the latest data that we have from the sixth assessment report. And we can see here looking at uh, towards the end of the century, 2100, sea surface temperatures around Nova Scotia are projected to increase by about four degrees Celsius. So again, reinforcing here that the temperature increases we're experiencing are not just in the air. Our waters are also warming by a very similar magnitude and they are a very major driver of our climate. For ocean pH, we're also uh, seeing some trends there. Um, you know, Prior to the industrial revolution, our average ocean pH was around 8.2. Today, it's around 8.1. Um, and that may not seem like much of a difference, but remember that uh, for those of you that think back to high school chemistry or anything like that, the relationship between pH and acidity is logarithmic. So each decrease of one pH unit is a tenfold increase in acidity. So looking into the future again towards 2100, we can expect pH in the marine waters around Nova Scotia to decrease by a further 0.4 units or so to around 
So again, just highlighting some of the, the trends in conditions and hazards associated with these changes. We're seeing increased ocean temperatures, which can impact ocean processes as well as many habitats and species. And marine heat waves are becoming longer and more frequent, both at the surface and in deep water. Our oceans are becoming more acidic, which can corrode uh, organisms that form carbonate shells like mollusks, crustaceans, and corals. And that can also lead to an increased likelihood of algal blooms. And finally, we're seeing a trend towards decreased marine oxygen levels, which can reduce the growth, reproduction, distribution, and survivorship of numerous aquatic species and result in the decline of important ecosystems like eelgrass beds off our coast, which do provide very crucial habitat for many of our commercially and recreationally important fish species. So I know that was a lot of information to absorb here. So again, if you're walking away with anything from this presentation about how Nova Scotia's climate is changing, these are the key messages to remember. It's getting warmer. Our precipitation patterns are changing. We're expecting more frequent and intense storms. Our sea levels are rising and our oceans are changing. Also a reminder here that this uh, section of the presentation is really just an overview of the climatic trends that we're experiencing in the province. There is a lot of additional information available for different parameters or more specific geographic regions, for example. And if you would benefit from any assistance in accessing, understanding, and applying that type of information, please don't hesitate to reach out. As I mentioned off the top, that is part of what I'm here for. But to finish off, I, I wanted to uh, bring this back to some insights for what this may all mean for our region. Um, so for this, I've pulled some, uh, some of the key messages and findings from the uh, recently released Atlantic chapter of the Canada in a Changing Climate Regional Perspectives Report. So this just came out in December of 2021. So I, many of you may not have had a chance to read it yet. If you have, wonderful. Um, just highlighting that uh, the, the lead authors on this report are actually two of my Climate Atlantic colleagues now, Sabina Dietz, who is our executive director, and Stephanie Arnold, who is our specialist in Prince Edward Island, uh, and certainly incorporates content from numerous contributing authors from diverse organizations across our entire Atlantic region. This is a report that compiles a lot of that regional expertise and, and lessons learned. Uh, it does also highlight numerous case studies in each key theme, including local examples of what others have tried and what they've learned that are really crucial for advancing adaptation. And I won't have much time to spend on those, but just wanted to highlight that this is a place where they exist. Please do go check it out if that sounds interesting. Uh, yes, so I wanted to, I'll specifically go through uh, in turn here five of the key themes that came out of this work related to climate change impacts and adaptation in Atlantic Canada. Those being that infrastructure is threatened by flooding and erosion. There are exacerbated risks to health and well-being. Indigenous experiences inform adaptation. Forestry, agriculture, and fisheries are vulnerable. And building adaptive capacity will strengthen resilience. And finally, we'll wrap up with some thoughts on the knowledge gaps and emerging issues that came out of this report. Just for one final piece of uh, context here, the reason why I'm zooming out to an Atlantic perspective at this point in time is that this is the most current information available. Uh, the province of Nova Scotia, which we have tailored the rest of this presentation to, is also very nearly ready to release an updated provincial climate change risk assessment. It should be coming out in the next weeks or so. Uh, very excited to share that with, uh, with everybody. But for the time being, I, I, I think it makes sense to, to pull from this report instead until that, uh, until that information is public. But to uh, go through the, the highlights of this report, like I mentioned here, we'll start with, uh, we'll, we'll go through each of these five key messages in turn, starting with number one, infrastructure is being threatened by increased flooding and erosion. So in our region, climate change is amplifying existing flood risks in coastal areas and in locations that are prone to overland flooding and erosion. Recognizing the risks, a range of adaptation measures are being implemented, including changes to infrastructure design, such as using engineering engineered protective structures as well as nature-based approaches to protect the coast you know flooding is certainly one of the more dramatic and costly events that we experience in our region and gets a lot of attention for quite good reason uh, the photo here is just from a flooding event in fredericton new brunswick Key message number two from this report was that climate change is, is exacerbating risks to health and well-being People living in Atlantic Canada are facing significant risks to their physical and mental health and well-being from climate change. Climate change exacerbates health issues associated with existing vulnerabilities in the region, which are influenced by factors such as socioeconomic status, ethnicity, employment, and living arrangements. Adaptation measures include public education, vulnerability mapping, and actions to address health risks and their underlying factors. So I really like this because it highlights how climate change risks are not evenly distributed. You know, even if we're, if we're facing the same temperature increase, it doesn't mean that everybody is uh, 
is under that same level of risk. So we really do need to acknowledge social inequities and the social determinants of health in adaptation work. The figure here is actually just showing some uh, heat mapping work that was done in, in Middleton, Nova Scotia to identify specific properties and neighborhoods that were more at risk, which I think is, uh, is quite fascinating. And I had more information on that case study in the full report. Key message number three is that Indigenous experiences inform adaptation in Atlantic Canada. So the, the Mi'kmaq, Wolostoyuk, and Peskadomagadi nations of the Wabanaki Confederacy have occupied the Maritimes region since time immemorial and have adapted to changes in climate and environment over countless generations. Partnerships with and leadership by local Indigenous peoples are vital to ensuring that the knowledge, perspectives, and experiences that they hold from living on the land inform adaptation in their communities and in the region. So certainly messages of very strong characteristics of resilience within our Indigenous communities uh, in Atlantic Canada. However, I think we do also need to acknowledge that climate change has accelerated to the point that traditional Indigenous adaptation philosophies are being forced to change and address the new reality. Uh, so for example here, just showing um, sea level rise projections for Lennox Island, which is a community, uh, in, in Prince, a Mi'kmaq community in Prince Edward Island, showing screenshots of uh, present day conditions on the top there, as well as a three meter sea level rise slash storm surge scenario on the bottom. And uh, just the scale of the challenge facing that community in particular is, is very well documented. Key message number four is that forestry, agriculture, and fisheries are vulnerable to climate change. Atlantic Canada's natural resource industries are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, and examples of adaptation are certainly found within each of these sectors, forestry, agriculture, fisheries, and aquaculture. But uh, the authors found that so far there remains a lack of collaboration among stakeholders to reduce risks from climate change. So really, foresters, farmers, and fishers are certainly interested in understanding the projected climate change in the short, medium, and long terms to improve their planning and decision making. And I think this is also a sector where they, the challenges presented are numerous, um, but these are sectors that are also uh, considering potential opportunities. For example, the longer growing season associated with agriculture and the potential to harvest newly arrived species in our, in our marine waters in parallel with some of those negative impacts that they're trying to, uh, to reduce the risks of. Uh, just because I have a little bit of background in this area, I wanted to highlight forestry specifically as a bit of an aside here. Um, just showing here uh, climate envelope maps for one of our uh, rather commonly found species in the province right now, balsam fir. And this is showing, uh, again, changes over three time periods from historical on the far left to the near future in the middle and uh, 2041 through 2070 on the right. We can see that the climate changes that we're projecting even over the next 50 years will alter the species that will likely thrive here. You know, particularly some of our boreal species are already towards the southern end of our range and we may not need, uh, future generations may not see too many of them. Uh, this is coming from some really great work that was done by the Canadian Forest Service and just thought it might be of interest to include here. But moving on with the report itself, key message number five was that building adaptive capacity will strengthen resilience. Adaptive capacity, which is really the ability of individuals, institutions, and systems to adapt and thrive to changing conditions, uh, is often constrained by limited human and financial resources. Partnerships and collaboration between different stakeholders, including governments, NGOs, academia, and the private sector, are important for driving adaptation in the region. Outreach, public education, and effective communication are key for building adaptive capacity in Canada. So really there's a need here to build networks that have the assets, the knowledge, the organization, and the agency to pursue some creative and uh, ultimately effective adaptation strategies. Final piece on the uh, Atlantic chapter report here, just highlighting some of the knowledge gaps and emerging issues. Uh, just in case any of you folks are uh, actively working in these areas, I think we should absolutely connect about that, or at the very least knowing that uh, these, are, these are knowledge gaps that uh, we'd like to pursue in the very near future here. So our research needs include things like incorporating or better applying the Mi'kmaq principle of two-eyed seeing or auto-optimum in adaptation, understanding how to better monitor and evaluate adaptation initiatives, how to effectively communicate and you know, customize the data and concepts that we're talking about here in a very intuitive manner and developing new visualization tools, for example, policy planning and adaptation budgeting, and manage relocation, which is really a, a proactive adaptation viewpoint. And often we focus on you know, armoring our shorelines rather than thinking about whether those communities are in a good place long term to begin with. So more research in that area would be really useful. Some of the emerging issues that have been identified are the inability to keep pace with the rate of change, the uh, 
challenge in coping with impacts on nature. You know, it's particularly difficult to generate public support to design, budget, and execute adaptation initiatives to help our natural systems adapt to climate impacts. The focus is really on humans most of the time. The added complexity of shared responsibilities across jurisdictions, which I think we're seeing play out in, uh, in a site like the Shignecto Isthmus right now. The lack of adaptation planning for new development, where even as new information is, uh, is starting to exist, it's taking some time to actually implement in new planning policies and regulations. And another uh, thought that was highlighted here was using Lyme disease as an opportunity to leverage across regions. Uh, taking the, the example that with the, with the spread of Lyme disease carried by ticks, uh, which has been made easier by climate change, um, there's some historical context there that minimized the severity of the disease, uh, there were poor diagnostics, some polarized political dialogue that impacted the public health response. So there's a very strong opportunity there to learn from situations like that as we start to face more similar challenges in the near future here. So just a few thoughts here on addressing climate change, because um, I think if the projections and the impacts I've talked about here show the scape or show the scope of the climate change problem facing Nova Scotia, I think a very natural question is what on earth do we do about it? And really there's two complementary approaches that are involved. First of these is mitigation, which are actions to reduce the emissions that cause climate change. And this certainly makes sense. You know, if we know that greenhouse gases are causing our climate to change, then working towards more sustainable transportation, clean energy and energy efficiency will help us tackle the root causes of that problem. However, just given our actions or lack thereof in recent years, uh, we know that just our, our climate has already changed and will continue to do so for decades to come at the very least, which means that we also need to adapt to what is coming. Um, so adaptation are actions to understand and address the risks that we know we'll be facing and even prepare for some of those new opportunities. So this includes different disaster management and business continuity processes, uh, understanding where flood risks are and working to better protect those areas and upgrading some of our infrastructure to, uh, to better account for some of the, uh, the projected changes in our climate. And certainly there's areas where mitigation and adaptation overlap when we're talking about water conservation, moving towards more local food production or expanding our urban forest. And I always like to highlight education here as well, because it's something you're all currently engaging in. And I hope information like this does help you make better decisions uh, in your own work going forward. So final thoughts here. Um, I, I know this has, again, been uh, probably a pretty packed 45 minutes or so, but uh, just if you're taking anything away from this, Here's a place to start. I hope the material I've gone through today does help to reinforce that our changing climate will impact infrastructure, ecosystems, public health, and ultimately our ways of life in Nova Scotia, which is why mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions will be crucial to avoid those most severe impacts I was talking about, as well as why adaptation will be necessary to adjust to the changing climate. A cross-cutting theme through a lot of the impacts work is that social inequities further increase climate change vulnerabilities. Uh, so that's really key to keep in mind for climate change programs and policies to be successful. They also need to address the root causes of those inequities and focus on ensuring that no one is left behind. Responding to the challenges of climate change will require ambitious collaborative efforts across all sectors and all types of organizations. So I hope you've all started to pick out roles for yourselves in, in ways that you can start um, making a difference on these files here today. And finally, good decision making starts with good information. So if nothing else, I really hope that this session has provided a useful starting point for understanding how Nova Scotia's climate is changing and how this might impact our region. But I will stop sharing my screen there. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions. But uh, well, Alio, thank you all for your time and attention here this afternoon. Alex, thank you so, so much. Um, I really appreciate this perspective. It's it's a a new lens to insert into our policymaking for sure um, that we have to plan for. Um, so a huge thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm Cynthia, I'm the chair of the um, IPAC Nova Scotia board. Uh, and I do wanna just spend the last couple minutes putting Alex on the spot and asking him a couple of questions. So Alex, out of all the adverse events that we just learned about um, as possibilities in the near future, uh, which do you think will be the most disruptive to the day-to-day -day life in Nova Scotia? And which ones do you think we need to prepare for most? Great question. I think, two answers to this question. Um, first, 
is the one that I think gets most people's attention, which is flooding, just because it's something that we currently experience quite a bit. And we know that if climate change is, 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 is exacerbating those risks of really all types of flooding from our uh, coastal flooding with sea level rise and storm surge to our fluvial flooding and pluvial flooding, even with some of those intense rainfall events I was talking about, uh, we know that many of our properties and communities and uh, people are at risk during those types of events and something we need to devote more, more planning to make sure that they're not um, that we're not investing in communities that are in particularly at risk areas or finding ways to, to better cope with those threats. So I think that's one that makes sense to a lot of people. The other one that I always really like to highlight is the high heat or the extreme heat events, um, just because that's something that has been less common in our area in the past. And it's something that um, particularly looking at the diversity of impacts there from, you know, impacts on public health and the way that we live and work and play outside, um, the, the way that that will impact our, our ecosystems and, and our infrastructure and everything there. It's one that I don't think has gotten quite as much attention just yet as it probably will in the years to come, just based on the breadth and, uh, and depth of those impacts. Great, thank you. And just one more question before we close it out. Do you have any advice for how some of the small and medium-sized communities could start planning to be more adaptive? So mayors and councillors and citizens in those small areas, um, what could they start doing to help change the course or be better prepared? Yeah, another fantastic question for me, I think we're always like to start people, particularly if they're new to this whole idea is uh, really with the, the thought that I ended that presentation on there is that, you know, you really do need you know, good decision making starts with good information. So for those communities that uh, really are just tackling this for the first time, I'm well aware of how, uh, how limited capacity can be in, in some small municipalities and NGOs and, and those types of organizations. Uh, if you have you know, one person dedicated to green initiatives, let alone climate change as, as something like that. Um, learn a little bit more about what's happening in your area. What are some of the, the priority risks that you're facing? Um, again, Climate Atlantic as an organization is here to help with that across the Atlantic region. Um, more than happy to offer her services to just sit down and have a chat about what's on your mind, what you're hearing from your citizens and constituents or whoever else that, uh, that relevant group is. Um, and there's a lot of fantastic different toolkits that have been identified and funding opportunities that are out there for communities that want to, uh, to start working down this uh, pathway to addressing climate change, whether that's through mitigation or adaptation or both. Um, so a lot of resources that are out there. Again, if you need just a, a hand in pointing you in the right direction, um, more than happy to uh, offer whatever help we can provide there. Um, yeah, I think really it's just a matter of starting to get, uh, of get finding a way to get started. Um, putting off those decisions isn't going to make them any easier in the long run. So we might as well understand what's happening and start to identify who needs to be aware of it, what decisions need to be made, and, and how to slowly work towards that path of uh, getting plans and policies and programs and awareness in place to make some real progress. Wonderful. Well, there you have it, folks. Alex is here to help. That's that's the message to take away. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so finally, just another big thank you to you, Alex, for spending some time with our IPAC family and sharing your insights on climate change, climate change and what we can anticipate for impacts. Um, I hope everybody out there enjoyed our event and thank you for coming in. Um, if you're not already a member of IPAC, this is my pitch. Get in the door. Come join us. Um, we do interesting speaker series and we're going to get back into some in-person events. So um, please come join us. Uh, and I look forward to seeing everyone at our next gathering. So thank you, Alex, and have a great evening, everyone.